Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Captain Justin Diaz from Santa Cruz Sheriff Station. Thank you for joining us. I see a lot of familiar faces out here, and we are uh, very grateful and very thankful uh, for Elevate Church and Pastor Mauricio for hosting this event today, something uh, near and dear to our hearts. I think it's important to use our clergy council to get the message out to uh, all of your parishioners uh, regarding mental health, and that's why we're here today. Um, over the last couple years, uh, Santa Clarita, and I know the whole entire country, has seen a huge spike in mental health-related issues. Uh, it's certainly not something that the police can uh, solve, or the city can solve, or the county can solve, or any entity, for that matter. Uh, it's got to be a community-wide effort, and uh, because of that, we've brought in some experts here today that I'll introduce in a minute, and um, hopefully... All of us here can be force multipliers and reach out to families, friends, parishioners, you name it, and uh, help with that. Uh, I can tell you on a side note, it's amazing. You go into our station jail and the overwhelming people, the overwhelming majority of the people that are arrested that make their way in that station jail um, have some sort of mental illness on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, and everything in between, um, or they are and or they're self-medicating with drugs or alcohol. So some have uh, all three issues going on, drugs, alcohol, and mental illness. And it's amazing, um, and it's scary. So hopefully we can uh, make a dent in that. But um, I'd just like to introduce a couple people before we get started. First off, uh, station chaplain, Eric Morgenstern. Um, Eric Morgenstern is head of our clergy council. He's been my partner uh, in crime, helping me through this for the last couple years. And uh, Eric's been great, and uh, I want to thank you for being here, Eric. Thank you. For Thank you for all you do. Uh, Larry Schallert, he'll be on uh, tape in a second, or he'll be up here on stage in a second. So Larry Schallert, and Larry, I'm going to have to read this because I can't memorize it because this is a long title. Uh, Larry is the Assistant Director of Student Health and Wellness and Mental Health Program at College of the Canyons. Uh, he is also the Chair of the Santa Clarita Valley Suicide Prevention and Postvention Wellness Committee. So. Thank you very much for being here, Larry. I appreciate it. And then Dan Broyles, uh, he's also going to be up here with Larry, and they're going to be giving you a talk. Dan is the care pastor at Valencia Hills uh, Church, and he is also a licensed family therapist. So, gentlemen, thank you for coming today. We are really looking forward to your insight and your expertise, and uh, hopefully the people watching this video um, you know, will be able to take all the information you're providing and... Um, give that to families, friends, parishioners, things of that nature. Thank you so much. Uh, Captain, thanks for your care for this really, I think, important topic that affects really all of us. Uh, it affects our community significantly. And so we're just, uh, Larry and I are just thankful for this, this opportunity. Thanks also to Elevate Church for uh, hosting. Definitely. We really appreciate that. And uh, it's been really personal, even on uh, home front in, in our, the church I'm part of, Alyssa Hills, in the last few months, we've had three families that have lost someone with uh, suicide. And so this is, this is really pervasive. This is affecting our community in more ways than we'd ever want. So uh, anything you, you want to jump in to say before I jump into the content? Uh, just thank Elevate Church and uh, Pastor Mauricio and Captain Diaz um, and uh, prayers for Mauricio's wife. And we really appreciate that you all are here and yeah, our statistics for our area, we keep, thanks for, to Captain Diaz, we keep close eye on statistics, including um, age ranges and means and um, number of suicides here in Santa Clarita. And um, we did really well for a while. Um, we cut suicides in half two years in a row, and then, but the last year, suicides doubled in 2021, and now we're on pace to double again, so in 2022. So um, you've heard about this all around the state, around the country. It's a very serious issue. I know that COVID and some of our local traumas um, are, are contributing, um, but it's a very serious issue, and we really have to, you know, in our committees we've decided we have to do everything we can. So this is one of the things um, that we can do is, is uh, force multiplier. I like that, Captain Diaz, you know. Have you guys uh, sort of... Uh, Pay attention to this issue and help us uh, out in the community. So we appreciate your care. Well, one of the reasons why I'm just so glad we're doing this is a, a decent amount of people actually feel more comfortable going to their, their pastor, their priest. They feel more comfortable going to that than even a psychologist, just depending on who you ask. And so 
Um, anybody who works kind of in a pastoral role is on the front lines helping people. Uh, one of my prayers, this is a personal prayer of mine, is God help me notice the pain around me. Help me not be so busy I miss the pain around me. Because it is. It's amazing when I prayed that, I end up talking to people in stores about suicide. It's amazing how things have come up uh, when I try to notice that. So if you want to put the first slide up, um, and just this is just an affirmation of your role and the difference you can make um, in the area of just your spiritual, spiritual life. So the second um, bullet there is from an interesting book I've been reading called The Spiritual Child out of Columbia University. And it just says, from the perspective of mental health and wellness, spirituality, and that's a really a broad term in this book, is associated with significant lower rates of depression, substance abuse, and risk-taking. Um, and this is really a broad-based kind of findings that they're finding is uh, how much a, a difference someone can make when they have greater hope outside of themselves, greater purpose, greater understanding of what, what they need. If you go to the very, very next one, um, this is some really interesting research that's, um, come out, that says that women who attended a church service on a regular basis were five times less likely to commit suicide. Five times less. So a lot of people, even in the professional world, even in the mental health world, don't know that. Um, there's, I think, a lot of fear of political correctness or fear of how to offend somebody with faith that they don't even talk about some of these topics. Uh, but they've, and I have personal reasons why I think this is true. I think two things. It gives a sense of community. I'm not alone in this. And it gives a sense of purpose. And, and both of those, I think, really affect our well-being, our mental health, our emotional health. And so, and I think that that's what's made the last couple of years so, so difficult, um, especially with COVID. There was some research done about a year or so ago, right in the middle of the pandemic, that said one in four young adults had contemplated suicide in the past 30 days. One in four, 18 to 22 year olds, right in the middle of the pandemic. And part of that is the loneliness mm-hmm. factor, and um, and even people not being able to go to a place of worship or church affects our well-being. I think we were designed to connect with people and not live in, in isolation. Uh, if you go to the, the, the next one, please, there's some int- more stuff that really talks about what you do is, makes such a difference and so valuable. Um, the second bullet here, and I, I used to work for DCFS as a social worker um, with child abuse cases, and one of the top indicators of someone uh, being at risk for suicide is past trauma. That, that's about as big as it gets. So just asking somebody about past trauma and showing just care for it even if you're like, I won't know exactly what to say, I'm not a trauma specialist, that's okay. Just showing care for it and that you have compassion for what people went through makes a difference. And anybody can do that. And showing that care for what happened. Um, the second bullet, child abuse victims uh, maintain a connection to their faith communities, have fewer mental health conditions throughout their life. It actually... When people grow in their faith, it actually reduces some of the long-term symptoms of the trauma, which is absolutely amazing to think of the impact. And it just shows the value, really, of the work you do that makes a difference. Because um, have you ever heard of the ACE score, Adverse Childhood Experience? If you ever want to just Google that one, it really is one of the most humbling research projects I've ever studied and looked at. It said kids who had four or more childhood traumas, it could be severe bullying, it could be domestic violence they witnessed, uh, uh, severe car accidents. Kids who had four or more had a lifespan that was reduced by 20 years. 20 years lifespan reduced. So trauma just has so much impact and it really does affect, I would say a majority of the people I talk to who are suicidal um, have trauma in their background. And one of the things that all of us can do is show care for that. We don't have to be their psychologist and solve it and be careful not to give two cliches to just make it all better or get over it, but just show, hey, I care about that. I want to hear, hear you. If, you if you feel safe to share. That's something that all of us uh, can do. You want to add anything to that point or yeah, your I mean, experience? 
Yeah, I, I mean, trauma is something we're going to talk about a little bit more, but um, focusing on, we, we call it being trauma-informed, mm -hmm. and, and we know that there's ways of managing trauma, and you don't have to be a therapist to manage trauma. Um, it's, sometimes it's really a matter of just listening uh, non-judgmentally, sort of assessing the situation. And um, we know in Santa Clarita we've had multiple traumas, not even you know individual traumas. We had the Saga shooting, of course. We had the fires. We, you know we've had you know uh, the borderline shooting, the Las Vegas shooting. At the college, we're still seeing students that were affected by the borderline shooting. They don't. That doesn't just like go away. Oh, that happened a couple of years ago. No, it comes around every November. Um, and say, same with the Saga shooting. We still we, a lot. Of, we have a whole bunch of students that are now at the college that were affected by the Saga shooting. They didn't get a lot of um, support after that um, because they went right into the COVID thing. So, uh, and the COVID thing itself is a trauma, but that doesn't even count sexual abuse, sexual assault, um, child abuse, that sort of thing, other kinds of trauma, emotional abuse. Um, so, um, earthquakes and fire and that kind of. So we really try to pay attention to trauma as one of the key, the key pieces that kind of underlines what we're, what we're doing in, in our approach. So one of the practical things you can do with someone with trauma is just say, your pain matters. Your pain matters. I want to listen to it. If you want to tell me a little or a lot, I just want to listen. And even in kind of the, your roles as, as pastor and clergy is your pain matters to God. And how can I just listen? And then also be that, that bridge builder to help them maybe see a therapist because it's scary to ask for help. You know, if you've had pain that you pushed down for 20 years or 10 years, there's, there's a lot of fear it takes to go, let me go face something that, you know, my family history or myself, I've, I've kind of squashed. Because um, there's a myth still out there, and I see this a lot in kind of even in church circles, that because it was years ago, it doesn't have much impact. But I just see that myth still... Uh, I deal with uh, sexual abuse a lot, and they're like, well, that was 40 years ago. And so there's this myth that that doesn't have much impact anymore, and it really does. And I know we see that significantly, the, the impact. I'll see it within five, ten minutes of a conversation with somebody, and just has so much impact, even more than they realize, because they're just trying to cope. They're just trying to get through. And it's important to remember, too, that when there's a trauma, invariably there's, you know, there's this guilt thing that comes in. Like, oh, you should have done that, or I could have done that, or I should have done more. You see this in, in whether somebody's been sexually assaulted or abused, or even in, in um, with military uh, folks that have been traumatized, or uh, even um, you know law enforcement and fire. There's like, I could have done, I should have done, my buddies, okay, you know. So kind of sometimes leading with, hey, it's, this is not your fault, this is not your responsibility. Because that's where we kind of go there. We go there a lot with loss, grief and loss, which is another mm -hmm. thing we look at closely when it comes to mental health. <clears throat> Things like sadness and anxiety and anger and, and um, even denial. But guilt is there, and people get stuck on guilt, and they can get stuck on guilt for 10 years. I should have, I should have. And then when you talk to them, you find out, hey, this was not your fault. Um, you know, And you have to sort of communicate that. All right, let's go to the next slide talk about some, just some quick stats. Um, probably one of the stats that's most alarming is it's fastest growing in 10 to 14-year-olds. That's been the reading I've been doing is, you know, t 10 years old is what, about fourth, fifth grade or so, fifth grade or so? 10 to 14-year-olds, that's really growing um, with, with our youth. And I don't think our social media is helping. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but you want to jump into a few more of the stats that stand out Boy. to you? <laughs> You know, at our college, we when I started the college, there was three or four suicides a year. Um, and so we did everything we possibly can. We're still doing everything we possibly can to address that issue. And for the last four years, we've had zero. And um, that's, you know, we think that's because we've told, we've tried to destigmatize the issue of mental health, destigmatize the issue of getting counseling, uh, training faculty, training students, training staff, being out there doing all kinds of you know activities and, and that sort of thing, that as a community we know we, we can do something. But nevertheless, there's 1,200 students a year, college students a year, that take their life. 
And we don't try to, you know, one of the things we try not to pull, we try to pull away from the word commit because we say we commit sins and we commit uh, crimes. So we're, tr we're trying to pull away from the word commit. They died by suicide or, or killed themselves or something like that. But nevertheless, there's 1,200 students a year take their lives uh, at college. So it's, and we know a little bit, you know, we know a lot about what kind of goes on, you know, in typical stress. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what kind of things are going on that sort of create that situation. But uh, for youth, you know, if, if you're a youth right now and you're dumping on t TikTok and you're dumping on Instagram and you've been isolated for two years and you don't really have a whole lot of friends and all your friends that you see are, you know, they're kayaking and they're going out and partying and they're doing all these great things. And what about you? You're not. Um, and maybe you got stuff going on at home that's not so happy, and so, um, or maybe you're gay, or maybe you're trans, or maybe you're you're not accepted by your family or your friends. So we know there's a lot of there's a lot of winds buffering out there that's leading to these these alarming statistics. One of the things that's adding to this is the number of internet addictions that's happening, and one of the signs of internet addiction is my. Primary relationships are online, and my secondary relationships are in person. And I think that's become more and more pervasive, is my primary relationships are online. And that's really few in this. Also, one of the stats that's not on here, I believe about um, 15 to 20% of the suicides in our country are with our veterans. Um, that's, a, that's a huge piece that um, a lot of our veterans, you know, they do amazing things for our country, but asking for help is, is a real struggle. That can be a real, real challenge, and because it's the opposite of what they've been trained to do, of you know, work hard, be independent, take care of business, all those kind of traits that do well in the military is really challenging um, for, for our veterans. Anything else on the stats you want well, to add? 22 veterans a day, the statistics are showing, take their lives mm -hmm. in, in our country. Now, what is that all about, you know? So, uh, be, and that doesn't mean, you know, people that have been in Iraq necessarily in Af Afghanistan recently. That means, you know, people that have been in Vietnam and, um, and older veterans as well. Uh, but it's a really high statistic, and that doesn't count um, the people that have been in, you know, attempted suicide and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a real serious situation, and we kind of have some sense of what that's about, um, you know, with trauma and, um, you know, what I like to tell our students is, okay, these guys... They're, in the, they're, in, they're coming back from college. They've been, you know, leading women and men. They've been leading, uh, you know, uh, 25, 35, 1,000, you know, soldiers. They've been operating multi-million dollar weapon systems. They've gone through all kinds of stuff. They've been traumatized. Maybe they've been sexually traumatized. Maybe not. But then they come home and they're sitting next to an 8 year teen year old that's on his phone. You know, and, and they're wanting to get some education, and they're wanting to get back into it, and they're going, what, "What's going on here?" I'm, you know, I'm used to doing stuff. I'm used to being respected for what I did, you know, and I, I've done some stuff, right? And 18 year old goes, "I don't know, what, wait, where'd you go? <laughs> Where have you been? Oh, you're older." <laughs> and so it's it's hard for some of, some of the folks to come back uh, and and uh, integrate back into into our society. So we're really trying to work, you know, with our community, with the veteran services, uh, getting our vet center on campus and that sort of thing, and getting the veteran services program going here in Newhall. One of the other stats that um, is kind of <coughs> misnomer is that most people think higher suicides are around the holidays. That's actually not true. The highest rate of suicides is in the spring, kind of that this time of year, actually, March through kind of June is the highest peak of suicide. People typically wait till after the holidays. Um, so th this time of year, between now probably and kind of the end of the school year typically, is actually the highest rate uh, of suicide. So the other thing I would just ask is, and I know people feel really ashamed about this in uh, churches and congregations, um, but just when substance abuse is going on, just to, I know it's really obvious, but with substance abuse come so many more risk factors. Um, I feel like that's a majority of the time there's some substance abuse involvement. One of the things I ask is what role does substance abuse have within your immediate and extended family? 
That's just a standard question I ask all the time. What role does any alcohol, pot, whatever, prescription drugs, what role does that play with your immediate family or your extended family? And it's amazing. I've never had anybody go, oh, n never, it doesn't. Right? Or if they do, they, uh, there's other issues probably going on. Or there's sometimes shame and uh, those type of things. Uh, anything else you want to add to, to this before we go on out some uh, risk assessment stuff? Well, on, on two, two things. On substance abuse, we're always, always looking at what's going on that leads you to using substance abuse. Yep. Right. And we're also going to what's been the res what's sort of the psychological, psychodynamics, and family problems that have resulted from your using substance abuse. Mm. It's not necessarily the substance, you know. But then, you know, we also, you know, we can go into the whole treatment thing, but, you know, learning how to deal with cravings and learning how to get, you know, work on your goals instead of, you know, getting on the side. Uh, just a back step to spirituality. One of the things we know really clearly is a lot of cultures like Asian American, Asian cultures, uh, Latinx cultures, and uh, African American black cultures, they rely on the church, you know. They, they're much more likely, as you kind of said, to go to their pastor or their doctor than, you know, a therapist. The therapist is like, well, you're crazy, you know, so um, especially in tradi more traditional cultures. So they're going to see you, they're going to talk to you probably before they talk to me, you know. And so, um, and this is true kind of a lot of research about across the board. So, you know, your ability to sort of um, connect with disparate cultural, different cultural communities is, is crucial when it comes to mental health. One, one more piece on substance abuse, just to add to that, that really is that one of the highest indicators of someone who's at risk for uh, suicide is when they feel like they're a burden to the people around them. Uh, that's something that can come up a lot within the faith or church community is people feel the guilt. So if you ever hear someone go, I just feel like I'm a burden to my family because I relapsed. You just paid 25000 for me to go to rehab, and then what happens two months later? There's a relapse, there's the guilt, and I'm a burden to my family. So whenever someone says, I feel like I'm a burden, uh, they eventually can get to the point where they think they're actually doing their family a favor by ending their life. They really start to believe that, and that's how they kind of mentally can get to this place of, I think it might be best if I'm not around. So when, whenever you hear, oh, I feel like I'm a burden to, it could be to our church community, to my family, to my parents, to my spouse. Maybe there's an ugly divorce going on or whatever it is. That's a sign of, of asking about uh, further risk factors or um, at risk of, of suicide. And that, that points to, in our community, and this is probably true of most communities, that our senior communities are the most often um, likely to take their lives, people 65 and older. When we first started our studies, we noticed that the transition age youth, the, the 15 to 25, was the highest rate of suicide. So we really worked with the schools and we worked with, you know, everybody that we could think of, uh, children's agencies, to really address that uh, with with prevention, postvention, meaning. Um, getting on, when somebody takes their life, getting on, talking to their best friends and their family and making sure that we have a, you know, a support around that. Um, but what happened was we really, we went from 11 transition age youth to one, you know, pretty quickly by doing that. But then we saw the senior uh, statistics really spike. So we pulled in the senior center, comfort keepers, um, Sunrise, anybody that has anything to do with, with seniors. And we saw a leveling off of that. But it's still, in Santa Clarita, seniors are the highest rate of suicide. And one of the reasons is because they think maybe they're a burden to their family. Um, but there's all kinds of other reasons you can imagine that we can talk about sometime. But um, being a burden is one of the key indicators. All right, why don't you go to the slide uh, number eight, the suicide risk assessment. We started talking about some of those. Risk factors. Can we go to seven first? Can we go to oh, you want seven? seven? That's fine. Jump. Can we go to That'd be seven? great. Okay. So, um, just kind of right, get kind of want to work through some of the what's going on. Like when um, when I sit down with a client, with a student, or whatever, I'm going to give them you know the standard 
confidentiality issue. I'm going to say, okay, everything here is confidential except for if you tell me there's a safety issue on campus, there's a you know it's firearm or something like that. I have to I'm mandated. If you tell me you have intention to kill yourself or somebody else, I'm a mandated reporter. I can't let that happen. If you tell me about an elderly person being abused sexually, physically, uh, emotionally, or a ch or a minor sexually, physically, emotionally, I have to, I'm a mandated reporter. Or if I get a court report, uh, court order. So those are um, they rarely happen in my in my world, but they do happen. So that's my confidentiality kind of speech that we always give to everybody. But then the next question I, I have is always, so what's going on? And it's a question anybody can ask. So what's going on? And the things that are going on, it can be this huge spectrum of things. You know, Dan's talking about trauma. You know, if you've been sexually abused, if you've been uh, physically abused, if you were in the military and you're, you had a military sexual trauma, for instance, do you know there's more men uh, military sexually traumatized in, in the military than women? Yeah, there's more men there, and, but it's a higher number. So um, if you have PTSD, for instance, you have, you have traumatic stress reactions to meaning you probably had a death or a near-death experience. Um, maybe you're in human trafficking. Believe it or not, we do have human trafficking right here in Santa Clarita. I've had several students when, now that I've been trained, I ask the right question, thanks to Dan and his committee. Um, but these kinds of traumas, and there's first responder traumas, right? Sure. People that have been, you know, people that are, you know, uh, at the ER or law enforcement or fire, um, sometimes you're the first responder, right? Um, the first responder trauma is, can be really significant because those, so because you're on the online, if you're, you're that, you're seeing really serious kinds of things, you know, young people dying, you know, that kind of thing. Um, my daughter is a mental health specialist. She always shotgun with the, with the sheriff, and she comes upon hangings and all kinds of incredible, terrible things, you know. So it's a lot of self-care is really important as, for you as well as us. You know, we say self-care is an ethical responsibility for therapists and probably for you too. So um, there's a lot of, I would add to that, a lot of compassion fatigue yeah. that kicks in. And one of the questions I like to ask a lot, uh, especially if I'm talking to an individual or a couple or a family, in which maybe uh, it's a law enforcement or... ER nurse or whatever the job is, is the question is, how does your job affect your family relationships? How does your job affect your family relationships? And often the kids or the spouse will actually say, say more. Because the person... Don't ask my wife that. Right? <laughs> because the person, if they have compassion and fatigue, they're often pretty numb to it. They're kind of numb to it. They're just kind of like on either autopilot or becoming irritable um, or isolating. So there, there's been a, 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 an increase with first responders ending their life, partly through on the COVID stressors of things um, the last two years. So that's, and that can happen even in, with clergy and pastors and the compassion fatigue and feeling the need that you uh, can't disappoint people. Uh, one of my, this is just a personal prayer of mine. Uh, it might sound a little weird, but I, I pray, God, help me disappoint people the way you'd want me to. Um, I think part of living in faith equals disappointing people sometimes because if you want to have more misery, meet everybody's expectations. Uh, I find that works all the time. So uh, I want to be a good a disappointer, not to be spiteful, but for the protection of my own relationship with my wife, my own relationship with God, my own relationship with my kids, I have to disappoint people. But sometimes people even in like uh, ministry or leadership they're great at helping people, but it becomes at the expense of themselves or their families, and that can be pretty overwhelming and kind of can grow. And even the families then resent their uh, either dad or mom or whoever's in that ministry role, they can just resent the, the, the faith. I've seen that happen quite a bit. Yeah. So other things that are going on are major mental illness. So we're talking about people that have schizophrenia, people have a bipolar disorder, they have a major depression. Um, Schizophrenia is like you might be hearing voices. Somebody, you might be th hearing uh, what you think is God, or you think the, is the devil, or your father, or your mother, or somebody 
screaming at you, telling you to do something, telling you you're a terrible person, you're paranoid, you think everybody's against you, plotting against you, that sort of thing. And you probably know bipolar disorder. You know, we don't say, by the way, we don't say people is bipolar, you know, just a stigma thing. You're not a bipolar person. You're not bipolar. You're a person that has a bipolar disorder. So we're trying to switch that. It's like you're not a cancer. You're a person with cancer. She's not a broken arm. She's a person with a broken arm. She's a person with a bipolar disorder. He's a person with schizophrenia. We don't say he's schizophrenic or he's autistic. He's a person on the autism spectrum. We have lots of people that have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression. A lot of these are really treatable with, with medications and socialization and therapy and counseling and that sort of thing. Um, but a bipolar disorder, you're going to be on this side, you might be super depressed, thinking you want to take your life. And on the other side, you might feel pretty good for a little while. And then another point, you might feel manic. You feel like on top of the world, you're spending all night, you're writing books, you're playing music, you're up on stage, you're doing great. And then you move into this irritable stage where nobody wants to be around you. Everybody around you is walking on eggshells and you're just nobody, you know, you're irritable all the time. You're always acting out, maybe fighting, maybe just being, you know, not, nobody wants to be around you. Everybody wants to be careful. And then you swing back and forth, back and forth like that. And it's really an un very, very uncomfortable uh, disorder. So, um, with medications, a lot of times we can, we can smooth that out, but it's still a serious situation. People have anxiety where they think, yeah, you know, they, everything's, everything's catastrophe, everything, the worst, they're always co considering the worst thing's going to happen. Um, so they have difficulty with anxiety and depression, you know, where they feel like they're a burden, they feel guilty, overly guilty, they feel like they're not good enough. When I hear that, I'm not good enough. That's one of the things I'm always looking for. Okay, that's a manifestation of depression. Not wanting to do things that you used to be able to do. Not having any motivation. Not wanting to hang out. Not wanting to do anything. You know, there's lots of symptoms of depression, but um, there's also life events. You know, um, families, family have family problems, family stress, economic distress. We have in our students, we have a lot of students that are in economic distress. Um, they have relationships, relationships problems, school problems. Um, we take relationship problems really easy. You know, when you get older, you say, um, oh, there's more fish in the sea. Don't worry about her. She's, she wasn't any good for you anyway. Or he was a bum. Don't worry about it. People kill themselves because of relationships. It's very common. So we, when somebody comes to us, when they say, hey, I got a relationship problem, they don't say it like that. It's my girlfriend cheated on me or my girlfriend rejected me, or there's something going on with my girlfriend, or we broke up, and this is a really, I'm, this is the end of the world for me, you know, with relationships. So we try to help them uh, work, work through that without saying, well, you know, you'll get over it, or there's plenty more girls. Well, she wasn't any good anyway. Try not to say that kind of stuff, because that's not the way you feel. If you remember breaking up when you, at any point in your life, with, with, uh, with a significant other uh, you know how, how serious uh, you felt about it and how, what, what a period of emotional distress you went through. Um, there's eating disorders where people look in the mirror and they go, um, I am really fat. You know, I don't like my body. And you look at them and they're like, wait, you're not, you're, you're not overweight. I'm overweight, you know. And so they'll go into this eating, there's this distortion of what their body looks like, or or so they start stop eating and they stop they start running and they do all kinds of, you know, uh, things to try to lose weight even though it's really, um, you know, uh, they'll try to throw up they'll take laxatives they'll do all kinds of stuff. Um, there's people on the autism spectrum. You probably does anybody know anybody on the autism spectrum? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So it's pretty common, pretty common. Uh, situation where people on the autism, if you don't know people on the autism spectrum, they, they, miss, they misread social cues a lot. They're a little awkward. Um, sometimes they, they walk funny or they talk funny. Their voice might be a little bit different. They have a hard time making eye contact. Making eye, talk, eye contact sometimes just like hurts them chemically, you know, so they won't make eye contact. But there's a myth that says they don't want to be social. They do want to be social, you know. Um, so we want to make sure that they feel comfortable 
a lot of people on the autism spectrum have been bullied since they were, they were the funny looking kid, they were the eccentric kid, they were the kid that got bullied. They were the kids that gets mercilessly, mercilessly bullied uh, on Facebook and in elementary school and junior high school when everybody wants to be normal. And so I'm going to feel normal by bullying, you know, that funny looking kid, that odd kid, that kid that doesn't fit in. So they can get really super suicidal um, when they're in junior high school and high school. And when they're in college, we try to, we have this thing called the Autism Social Alliance where we bring a lot of the students. We have like two or 300 students that are on the autism spectrum. They can do really well. They can graduate. We sent them to Yale and to UCLA and everywhere else. Um, and sometimes they just take one class. So, um, but people on the autism spectrum often are misread and uh, sometimes they act out because they feel like they were, you know, they were bullied or they misread something. So they act out and then they get scapegoated and it's like this thing. So we try to teach them and we try to treat law enforcement to, hey, go in and say, hey, you know, you're cool, you know, and, and make that relationship with them. So can I jump in there real quick? Yeah. There's actually been some research that I've read that uh, talks about there's more long-term negative effects of bullying than we initially realized. That, they, you know, they were bullied in that, you know, seventh grade class uh, when they're, you know, 13 years old, and now they're 25 and it's still really having impact on their view of their self, view of trusting relationships, view of their body, uh, all those things, those words that were said to them now become their thoughts they say to themselves. It's becoming pretty, pretty common. So sometimes we can minimize that and go, oh, you know, that was when you were younger, you know, those, those days. But they're finding it's really affecting um, the longer-term emotional health uh, with our young adults as they're in the college age and even and older. Uh, some other uh, risk factors. Um, um, men are far more at risk. I think 78% of completed suicides are male. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, actually, Caucasian males are the highest rate. Uh, that in Native American has a lot, there's a lot, but Caucasian males is pretty high. Another really high risk factor to really think about is if you have a close family member who has completed a suicide. If you have a close family member that's sibling, I'm not talking about a third cousin, I'm talking about that you know, that, that parent, that sibling, um, the chances go up 600% for somebody to now consider that as an option, as a way to cope. And part of it is, and here's, if you don't know what to say to somebody, I'm going to give you one sentence you can say to anybody almost. It's this. I get the sense that you don't want to die, but you want the pain to go away. Almost every time I've said that to somebody, they're like, that's it, because they've tried all these other options of getting rid of the, I would say, the emotional, relational pain or whatever they're facing. And, and they don't, most people don't want to die. They want the pain to go away, and they're not sure how to do it. It's just like this, this literally like this flood and this tornado of emotion that just is so over, um, overwhelming. I just want to say something about the, the gender. Sure. More men take their life. Most, most of the time, they're more, they use more lethal means like firearms. Yep. But more females attempt suicide. Yep. That's true. And by a pretty high margin. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, females will give off. And this is not true all the time, so you can't guarantee this happens. But they'll, they're more likely to reach out and tell somebody, or they're more likely to use pharmaceuticals or something like that. So they can be saved somehow, or they'll, they'll let somebody know. Uh, but men less likely to let somebody know, l more likely to use lethal means. So they actually complete suicide more. Right. So this is not a, a political statement about guns at all, especially start off with the sheriffs here. Uh, but about 50% of uh, suicides are, are lethal because of guns. So that about half of the suicides and often that's more with, with men than it is um, w with women. So one of the things that all, all, you can do, especially within our places of worship, is just talk about the topic. Um, when it's talked about in different places, people feel less alone, and people feel like, oh, maybe, maybe I could talk to you about that. I had a, I had a friend of mine, uh, she would, described herself as a, a Christian therapist was her kind of niche. I would send people to her, and she would see people, 
And she decided, just because in the kind of the church world, she wanted to become a specialist in the area of healthy sexuality because it wasn't being talked about kind of in her church context and what she knew. And so she went back to school, got extra, I think, graduate certificate in this area of sexuality and how to deal with that. And so she changed one little thing at the end of her first session. At the end of her session, she would often see couples. That was kind of her thing. She would say the following. You know, I know there's just, there's, we can't cover everything in the first session. There's a lot of stuff. We're just getting going. So if there's anything in the next couple of weeks that you'd like to talk about in regarding, you know, communication or uh, other areas of relationship like sex, just let, let me know. She changed that one little piece at the end of her talk to add that one last sentence. And she goes, it was amazing. 50% of her couples now needed help with their sexuality. Now, did the couples change? No. What she conveyed was what? I'm comfortable talking about it. So now what does the couple think? Oh, this therapist can handle it. They're comfortable talking about it. So all of a sudden, areas of uh, couples not having sex or past sexual abuse, all those things uh, started now coming out that weren't coming out before she used that one sentence. And the same thing, I think, is with suicide. When we talk about it in healthy ways and convey this is something we want to address and help people, it's a message that you can talk about and bring it up. So that's just something that I think churches can do a great job of just addressing that there is hope in this topic and we can talk about it. Because when it's not talked about, that the feeling is I'm a burden will come up in their head. Uh, oh, we don't talk about that here, meaning this church culture or whatever, whatever it is. Um, Anything you want to add on that one? No, I mean, it's really important to talk about it and to, and to, li and to listen. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we're listening for is, you know, have you made a previous attempt before, you know? Mm -hmm. um, do you have social support? Um, one of the number one things that Dan mentioned is you know, history of attempts, but a history of family attempts, best friends. Best, mm -hmm. The best friend took, them, took their life. That person is high risk, Absolutely. right? So we always, when there's a suicide, we always look at post pension who's the best friends, who's the family, you know? But one of the number one things we look for is an organized plan. So does somebody have an organized plan? What I mean by that is uh, if somebody comes to me and says, can I use you as an example? Sure. Okay, Dan comes to me and says, hey, I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow. I go, oh, that's great, Hawaii tomorrow. Fantastic, you got your car rental? No, nah, no. Nah. Not yeah, but you got your hotel? No, nah, I don't have you, ticket, you know? Well, no, but do um, you got the time off? No, but man, Hawaii just sounds good. Okay, so Dan's probably not going to Hawaii tomorrow. He's thinking about it, you know, uh, right? Uh, <laughs> escapism. <laughs> so Dan comes to me and says, hey, I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow. <laughs> Fantastic, Dan, you, you got your tickets? Here they are. Got your dog covered? Yeah, got your you got your uh, rental car. You gotta have a rental car in Hawaii, right? Yeah, I got the rental car. You got your hotel. Got the hotel. Got your vacation. Everybody knows you're going. Dan's going to Hawaii tomorrow. He's got a real organized plan. Somebody comes to you and says, "I'm thinking," or you you ask a question because you can ask the question about suicide. That, you know, we talk about this a little bit later, but asking the question about are you t thinking of taking your life does not put the idea into their head. The idea is already into their head. They probably mentioned it some way or another three or four times to other people. So if you ask somebody, uh, it doesn't put it in their head. It actually it's a sense of relief. Finally, somebody's Absolutely. asking me directly about, about suicide, and I can tell them. But, but, but if somebody says, yeah, I'm thinking about suicide, okay, how would you do that? Well, I'm thinking maybe someday when I get, you know, you know, enough money, I'm going to drive to New York, or I'm going to get to New York, and I'm going to jump off the Empire State Building. Okay, we live in California. Um, no way to get to, San, to, to Empire State. It's probably not going to happen. Serious situation. This person's thinking about suicide, but it's not a real organized plan. Someday I'm going to jump off, you know, if somebody says, you know, let's say a youth says, I'm thinking about, you know, are you thinking about taking your life? Yeah. Yeah, well, when would you do that? Tonight? Oh, okay. How, how, how would you do that? With, with a gun. Do you have access to a gun? Yeah. Where is it? Well, it's in my stepfather's um, 
um, closet. Wait, is it locked up? No, it's under all his clothes. Okay, do you, you have ammunition? Yeah, where's that? It's under the bed. Keep some of the bed just in case, so, you know. Okay, when are you planning on doing that? Tonight. Well, is anybody going to be home tonight? No, they're never home. As a matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm basically live there by myself. They're always out. So you think about taking taking your life tonight with a with a with a firearm, your fa stepfather's firearm. Yeah, tonight's night. That's an organized plan. That's not an unusual plan. That happens. You know, we try to tell parents, hey, you lock your firearms up. You know, or be if you have a firearm, pay attention to family members that might be thinking about suicide or have depression. Uh, but that's 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 like you're you're driving to work. You're a little bit late. Um, and you see a little girl get hit by a car, car drives away, kid's in the middle of the street. You can't leave that person alone. Like, oh, oh shit, I, shoot, sorry. <laughs> I gotta stop and help this little girl, right? That's the same thing with this person. This person's got an organized plan. They're gonna kill themselves, most likely, tonight, if you don't do something. There's lots of things you can do, you know, and we can talk about those things in, in terms of, sometimes, if you can just delay things for 10, 15 minutes or an hour a day, sometimes three, out, three days you know, in the hospital or something like that, or connect with family members. There's all kinds of things you can do with that. So it's not like this, you know, there's nothing you can do, but it's certainly an anxiety provoking situation, but you can ask those questions and find out if there's an organized plan. Somebody says, and then you say, well, have you ever tried it before? Yeah, I tried it before. Well, what'd you do? Well, I tried to hang myself, but the, the belt broke. Okay. Has anybody else killed him? Yeah, my daughter, my father killed himself. Okay. Now you're starting to stack up all these risk factors. Okay, teenager, stepfather, late alone, uh, previous attempt, that kind of thing. So you're looking for those sorts of things, and you don't have to be an expert to do to do this. But this is something that happens, and I know some of you may have had this experience in your life. So. Um, Yes, if you need to take a break on this, and we didn't really do a, right. a good proper thing, but this stuff brings up stuff, you know, because people have family members that have taken their life that, are, that have mental health issues, you know, so, but having an organized plan is one of the number one things we're looking for, hopelessness and, you know, previous attempts, that sort of thing. So what well, Larry is saying is really spot on. The more specific the plan, the greater the risk. And most people, even people I know who've worked in churches, have a level of anxiety about asking these questions. Like, it's just, can we do other ways of helping people? Like, it's, it's hard. And so the anxiety you might feel of asking, like, do you have a plan or is there a specific way you've thought about hurting yourself, that might be tough for us to ask, the anxiety in us, but it actually be a relief for them. Right. I've had so many people, I, uh, probably feels like hundreds of people, in which they'll give these little hints and I'll just say, you know, in the midst of everything, have you thought of hurting yourself? And they'll say the following. You know, you're the fourth person I've told my stuff to, but you're the first person who's asked about suicide. I've had that happen over and over and o over again. Is they'll give these little clues of a burden or substance abuse or a family member with suicide. And, uh, and if there's really a, any, a, I would say, a very specific plan, that's where you need outside help. That's where even where the sheriffs can... Uh, call 911 to have them assess to be hospitalized. I would say if they have any really specific plan, don't handle that yourself uh, when you have any specific plan because uh, they might need to go to the behavioral unit to be assessed. Um, and if you're not sure, they also, anybody can also go to the ER room at Henry Mayo is also a place um, that, that someone can get uh, some help. Another kind of risk factor to think about this, and this really affects people of faith, um, obviously, depression is a huge indicator, but even bigger indicator than depression is hopelessness. Um, so, uh, uh, most people I talk to can you think of a time you felt pretty discouraged or even down. Of course, I mean that's just kind of human nature at times. But the idea of hopelessness is a pretty strong indicator to ask about, and this is where I think people will come to see their pastor or clergy as, as they're looking for hope. I've had, for instance, a number of parents over the years saying, I feel depressed, but I have hope because I have my kids. I'm not going to do anything to myself. There's a lot of situations out there where kids have actually unintentionally kept their parents alive because they're like, I don't want to do that to my kids. 
Um, and that's really been impactful and really been a, a, a big, a good hindrance for them ending their life. So asking about purpose, say, do you feel like you have any purpose lately? Uh, and I would use the word lately. Um, I, really is an indicator, again, one of those red flags if they go, no, I really don't have any purpose. Like, you need to start asking more of those specific questions that Larry was just um, re really referring to. So especially with our young people, one of the things also to, to, to look for is um, when they're doing risky behaviors, um, uh, whether it's how they drive or some of the, the risky stuff that can go on out there, um, and what are they doing. Uh, one of the things I like to ask about is uh, wh what type of things interest you most on your phone? With our young adults, what type of things interest you most on your phone? Uh, I also like to ask, Tell me your top connections in real life and top connections on your phone. Um, it just, it does, especially a lot of us, we didn't grow up thinking of that stuff. But again, it's, it's another way to kind of draw out what's going on, especially with our teenagers and um, our, our young adults. Another thing that just to think about uh, as a, a factor, and then this comes up in church settings, is the idea of shame. Um, I think shame can deteriorate. Um, even spiritual motivation or other parts of motivation uh, that, that can be really something that, if you ever want to sit on an airplane and have not, someone not talk to you, just read a book on shame. It works all the time. <laughs> I, I actually unintentionally did that one time. I'm literally on a, a flight. It said something about shame. It was the cover, and you get to see the person next to me look down, and then they didn't say a word for two and a half hours. Right, because uh, it's like no, we all know what that feels like, but no one wants to go there. But that really affects our mood, it affects purpose. It actually can uh, really deteriorate how open we are with people in our in our, our relationships. So it's again, it's an area that we don't really talk about, but it has such uh, impact. And shame can come from within or from without. Uh, the one, the, you know, shame, humiliation, embarrassment, oh, yeah. guilt. These are some of the most painful emotions that we feel. We don't mm -hmm. like any of them. They're, they're painful, right? Yep. And people kill themselves because of overwhelming shame, guilt, embarrassment, humiliation. So you talk about, you know, yep. um, bullying, you know, it comes up shame, humiliation, yep. um, embarrassment. And people hold on to that for a long time. So, uh, but people can talk about it if it's safe to talk about. You want to go to slide 11? How's that sound to you for sure. the action plan? We've talked about some of that. If you, yeah. if you want to add to that. I just want to throw out one more time real quick. You know, are we running out of time? <laughs> because it's really important, um, giving away prized possessions. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, you know, I had a student that, you know, his best friend killed himself, and he said, oh, my, my friend was so great. He gave me all this cool stuff. He gave me his surfboard. He gave me his guitar. And, in mid-sentence, he realized, oh, he was giving away his prized possessions. Mm -hmm. um, so he, did, he didn't know that, that that's a, that's a warning sign, but it is, you know, things like that. Feeling trapped, you know, um, being agitated, dramatic changes in moves, these kind of things we're looking for. But we, we did want to talk about the action plan, um, yeah. stuff, stuff that we can do. There's this thing called mental health first aid. And we're going to give you like a mini mental health first aid training here. You know, it's usually like an eight-hour training. It takes all day. You learn all about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and everything else, um, and trauma and eating disorders and everything. But the same action plan is helpful for all those disorders. And um, you know, we're going to make you memorize it. After eight hours, you would memorize uh, mental health first aid, the algae thing. But... Um, so let's just go into it. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll take about five minutes of this, and we'll jump into the spiritual part at the end. Okay, good. So um, you're, you're assessing. It's kind of like what Dan said. You're assessing for risk or harm. You're asking, are you thinking about taking your, taking your life? You can ask that question. Is this, person a, a, a safe, is this person safe right now? You're assessing for what's going on. And they go, well, why did you ask that? Well, I just noticed this and this. You just heard all the different kinds of possibilities that you might... Uh, might be going on, but I, but I saw you're, you're giving away all your cool stuff, or or you've been moping around lately, or you're doing a lot of risky behavior. You, you give reasons why you're assessing, but you you can kind of approach somebody and you don't get in their face, but you may get to the side and kind of ask them, assess what's going on. So that's really easy to do. Anybody can do it. 
don't have to be a therapist to assess whether somebody's a risk to themselves or others. But the most important one is the second one, listen non-judgmentally. You wouldn't be in the position you're in if this wasn't your bailiwick. This is something you probably do better than anybody else. You listen non-judgmentally. Just, you know, you're not saying, oh, you know, she was like, or, oh, you shouldn't have done that, or, you know, well, if you would have done this, you know, you could have did this better. You know, it's listening non but get the whole story, you know. Don't be judgmental about what, how, how they say, because if they feel like you understand them, that's, you're saving their life right there in a lot of different ways, you know. But if you totally understand them, then what you say has going to have more weight than if you don't understand them, you know, in, in, a, in a very kind of intimate way. So listening non-judgmental. And I would add to that, don't act shocked by their story. Yeah. If you, act, if you do the what? I can't believe you did that. What? <laughs> what you're conveying is they are now a burden to you. That's how they'll feel. They're like, well, I can't go there. I can't open up. So even if the story is pretty dramatic and the trauma was really severe or some really crazy family story or whatever it is, just that calm demeanor of just, I want to listen more. And here's what I always, always suggest. Be more curious about them than their story. So how is that for you versus what else happened? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that really shows care. Yeah. Uh, all right, how about reassurance and information? So this is where we come in, what Dan was talking about, hopelessness. Yep. Uh, hopelessness is one of the primary indicators of suicide. It's a, it's, a, it's a symptom of depression. You know, we talk about learning how to manage hopelessness. It's a symptom of depression. But it's very, very real and it feels very, very intense. Mm -hmm. But when you give reassurance, you say, hey, you know, things can be okay. We know people recover from this sort of situation. We lose words use words like recovery. We know people can recover from almost any trauma. We know people can recover from almost any relationship or mental illness even. Uh, so giving reassurance and information. The more you learn about mental health issues, the better. So if you know some about schizophrenia, if you know some about autism, if you know some about bipolar disorder, you know some about trauma. So if you do some research yourself, I mean, that's kind of what mental health per se is, like eight hours of that. But if you can do that yourself, getting information about certain disorders and certain situations is important. But giving re reassurance uh, is important. The next one is encouraging prof professional health. There's a lot of stuff you can do, but what we try to tell people that aren't necessarily mental health professionals is to go ahead and encourage professional health. We know that people can recover. We know that trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is very helpful with trauma. It's very helpful with depression. Cognitive behavior is very helpful with depression. It's very helpful with anxiety. We know there's some medications. Almost nobody recovers from schizophrenia without some medication. Same thing with bipolar disorder, and in a lot of cases with major depression. Uh, people can recover without medications from anxiety and depression and all kinds of other things, and trauma, trauma is not even you know, that amenable to medication all the time. But getting professional help is really important. Psychiatrists, clinical social workers, which I am, uh, marriage and family therapists, um, that kind of thing. Um, so encouraging professional help. And you have some handouts and we'll have some resources. Local, locally, we're really good. We have a really good, strong uh, professional uh, clinical uh, diaspora here in Santa Cruz. And then encouraging, the last one is encouraging self-help and other support. So self-help. That's where you guys come in, right? Um, Faith-based uh, organizations, um, spirituality, but also AA or, or, or uh, NAMI, National Alliance for Mental Illness. Uh, exercise, coping, uh, stuff like breathing and meditation and yoga and, um, you know, the hot tub, is, you know, stretching, uh, walking in the rain. There's lots of different self-help. You know, for us on campus, a lot of times it's affiliating with a, with a club of, of interest, you know, getting together with other people. We know affiliation is a really important part of mental health. So encouraging that self-help and building up the kinds of self-help um, that, you know, the more self-help kind of strategies you have, the better. So when you go into a situation where you're thinking somebody's thinking of t taking their life, or even if they're not, even if they're on the, on the edge of that, to be able to go in with this kind of action plan, um, assess, listen, give reassurance, encourage professional help, and encourage self-help, and have that professional help stuff ready. We had some cards that we gave out. Have that ready to go so you know who, and make relationships with your 
with your, with your fellow, you know, uh, helpers in the community. Uh, you have that ready to go. That'll help you with your anxiety when you when you're in a situation where somebody might be thinking about killing themselves. Because there are things, are things to do in those situations. So just because we're with a bunch of you know clergy pastors, uh, here's some other cries for help that might not happen in other settings, but definitely in places of worship. Um, and I've seen these um, definitely in my role at, uh, as a pastor. Sometimes people will ask. Uh, what, spiritual questions, but they're really Christ for help. Or it might appear like a theological question. So does God forgive suicide would be a question I've had that asked. Or if someone commits suicide, do they go to heaven? Like those type of questions. If someone asks you those questions, please, please do not answer it right away with your theological bent. This has been really tragic. This has happened numerous times. Where someone from whatever denomination or church they're part of answers it however they think, and they didn't realize they thought it was just a theological conversation. It was a really cry for help, and they go home and they end their life. Um, so here's how I do this when I get those questions. Because I've been asked this numerous times. I'll say, you know, I love to talk to you about that, but can I first just ask why you asked that? I, I'm just curious. I've had numerous people say, well, actually. I literally had one person say, well, I was getting my life tonight. I just wanted to know what's happening next. And it, it wasn't a theological question at all. It was really, they don't, they're embarrassed. It's like, you know, because I, I have my faith, I shouldn't be thinking about this. So they're embarrassed. And this was their way of asking. So just ask the why. A majority of the time when people have asked me these questions, it's not a theological conversation. It's really a cry for help. So please see this as a cry for help versus, oh, you kind of just share your kind of knowledge. Now, there's the f small chance they might have a theological question, but literally about 80% of the time for me personally, it's been a cry for help, and 20% of the time it's they're grieving someone who died with suicide and they need help with their grief. All right, so it's really been either cry for help or grief. Almost 95% of the time I've had this. Um, on the next page of the slide, um, there's actually a number of stories that, of, you know, uh, that would never be on a Christmas card. Uh, of suicides in the, in the Bible of Elijah, Jonah, Moses, all three of them actually use phrases like, God, take my life. They all use something of that nature. And these are people that are considered both in the Christian and Jewish kind of worlds pretty, pretty significant individuals. And all of them go to God in a sense of prayer like, I'm done. Take my life, better off dead. Um, and there's different reasons to them. Like Elijah was lacking some self care, uh, Moses, some mo uh, leadership challenges. Here is the common three theme with all three of these. They all have a common theme. All three of these had severe loneliness and isolation. All acted alone. So, so a good question I ask people, I even ask other kind of pastors, what part of your life do you feel alone? What part of your life do you feel alone? And that's not just for pastors or religious leaders. That's across the board. Um, it's amazing what comes out after that question sometimes. Of what part of your life do you feel alone? Um, because the greater the isolation, just the greater of, of risk. Because um, I think we all need uh, connection. On the next page is a bunch of other resources. Um, that uh, There's a national suicide hotline number. I encourage you to just put that in your phone. If you don't know what to do, it's 7.30 on a Saturday night. And you're like, what do I do? And you're with somebody. Just call that hotline number with somebody. Literally, you literally... If they're like at your church or whatever, just call that number to, together. Don't have them go home. Have someone that can help assess what to do. And they, either by text or hotline, it's a 24-hour number uh, that someone can use. Sometimes I'll actually, if it's like not severe risk, I'll say some minor risk, I'll have them put this in their phone. Or, and they might call or, or text in the middle of the night. Uh, there's a, a book there. That's actually for pastors, chaplains. Uh, um, it's really good. Also, all of you, this is not the hospital. They actually have a community mental health drop-in center for urgent care uh, mental health uh, issues. And then the last two, the last slide, um, Be the Difference in the Heart District. Uh, these are all, there's a lot of resources. Uh, I know Larry and the Suicide Task Force did a lot of this for the Be the Difference um, and put this together. Again, these are other resources I would encourage you just to look at, uh, just to, so you're ready when things pop up um, and we, just to be more equipped about what, what's really available. Also, our emails are there. Feel free if there's something that came up today that you're like, I have a question about, or 
could you maybe talk to our staff about this sometime later? This is stuff we could be up here for a lot longer, um, but we just want to make a difference and help in this way. We just uh, really have a passion to really make, make a difference. And like was said earlier, this is not just for the, the law enforcement. This is not just even for churches. This is a community-wide thing, yeah. and this is something that we all can agree on. We want less of yeah. uh, with people in our, our lives that are hurting and are struggling, and we want to care. So that's our emails. Feel free to reach out to us later. Uh, anything else you want to add just to, to close? Well, maybe a couple things. With this Be the Difference, scv.org, you can click on that and you will get a lot of information about mental health in general, um, veterans, LGBTQ, which, uh, as we know, are like a high-risk mm -hmm. uh, suicide uh, group, but also all of our resources in Santa Clarita and northern San, San Fernando Valley and Southern Antelope Valley. So there's a lot of great resources in there. We try to keep it super current. So you can go on there and get a whole bunch of stuff. Also, uh, one of our members of our suicide prevention uh, task force is the Department of Mental Health. So they have um, a lot of different kinds of trainings, like mental health first aid, like QPR, which is question, persuade, respond, um, assist, all these different like mini programs of an hour or two hours or three hours or eight hours, whatever, they can come out to your congregation and give trainings just to your whole congregation um, for free. So um, they're called the Partners in Suicide Prevention um, from the Department of Mental Health. And, and we're happy to do it to yeah. a certain Glad degree to as well. You know, we're happy to. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for being here and for paying attention to this really important subject. As Dan says, it's a community, uh, Community effort, it's a community problem uh, that together we can all, uh, if we all pitch in together, we can make a difference. Well, thanks for joining us. I know this is also being recorded online um, for the community, also, and we're just really thankful for that. And thanks for coming. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. What's the biggest mistake that you see pastors making right now when it comes to mental health? Oh, uh, <laughs> we have a part two class. No. I would say um, sometimes I think people can uh, hide their pain behind spiritual answers. Uh, we can... Uh, uh, so I think sometimes spiritual knowledge can be a mask for emotional pain to be processed. And there's a fear of if I grow deeper in my faith, there's less need for me to get help. Like, well, I've been a pastor for 20 years. Need to get help? Like, there's this idea that the more so mature I am in my faith, the less I have need for help. So that would be, be two things, I would say. A question back I think there. I'm going to leave that alone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for doing this. This is a huge topic and, and such a help. Um, on, on the mandated reporting side of things, do you have any good resources for pastors to study and learn up on where we should, where we shouldn't? Like if I'm having a conversation with someone, then all of a sudden they're talking about their past and when they were two and this abusive trauma they went, and it's like, okay, do I report this? Don't I? What's the, yeah, yeah. So I can ask for that. I don't know if Larry has a thought. There's also uh, there's an organization out there called Net Grace. Um, a woman named Diane Langberg that, that actually helps like religious organizations deal with abuse stuff and how to do that really well. Um, you can always email me. I used, as a, I used to work for DCFS. So I get probably calls probably about twice a month on that topic. So I have this situation, is it reportable? I actually am still doing stuff for them on the side called the Faith Collaborative. Um, but Net, Net Grace would be a good one. If also email me, I can send you some other resources. Yeah, I think Department of Children and Family Services is re is really a good one, yep. or the Office of uh, um, Adult Protective Services for elderly people. Um, but if you don't, if you have that question in your head and you don't know should I report or not when it comes to like child abuse, for instance, you can call the child abuse hotline and just say I want to make a, yep. a question. I'm not we sure. do that all the time. Um, you know, it's a borderline, or like, I don't know. Um, 
and you call them up and say, you know, I'm just asking about this, you know, and they'll go, that's a no-brainer, you, you have to report it. And they'll say, you know, that's not reportable because you don't have an address or you don't have it's something you don't have. You know, if you get more information, maybe. Um, but they'll help you with that to make that decision so it's not like all yours, you know. And then if they say, yeah, it's reportable, then you have to go ahead and do the paperwork and, you know, call it in and stuff. But they handle that all the time. Yeah. Help make that decision even on a phone call. Yeah, you don't want to have to make that decision by yourself yeah. unless it's like obvious and you already know. Right. Good question. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.